20 years ago, the Ottawa Treaty was signed. It aimed to ban the use of anti-personnel landmines. Canada played a key role in getting global buy-in, but decades later, did it do what the signatories had hoped for? Let's find out from Miroslava Tatarin, Institutional Partnership Manager for Handicap International Canada, Jane Cocking, Chief Executive of the Mines Advisory Group, and Paul Hannon, Executive Director of Mines Action Canada. Welcome to you all. Um, before we get into what the Ottawa Treaty was and what it does, I wanted to ask a really basic question. What is a landmine, Jane? A landmine is any device which is, has an explosive in it and which is on or near the ground, but very crucially is intended to be activated by the victim. And so it's something that could be stood on by a person, driven over by a vehicle, and the Ottawa Treaty is about those anti-personnel mines, those terrible devices that are designed to directly maim the people who tread on them. We hear a lot on the news about IEDs. Would that mm. classify as a landmine? IED is a little bit of a complicated term here. There are devices which are called, referred to as IEDs, which work just like a landmine. They are something which is put together, uh, sometimes made out of a cooking pot and a battery and some explosive. If it is intended by the person who leaves it there to harm or kill somebody stepping on it, then it's a landmine. And Paul, I, I, picking up on what you said, um, what are these weapons used for primarily? Well, they used to be used to defend areas, but the nature of war changed in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and uh, they became wars within communities, within towns, and they're no longer really seen as a defensive weapon. They're more seen as a, a weapon of terror. You terrorize Because they, they last, they can uh, be in the ground for 50 years? They can be in the ground for many, many years. There are people now still being killed and injured from mm -hmm. conflicts that ended 20 years ago. And uh, Miroslava, can you describe a typical casualty of these weapons? So the type, so, so if somebody walks or picks up a landmine and it explodes, it could kill them or they could survive. And when they survive, it really depends whether it exploded in their hands. And if so, they'll have injuries to the face, to the hands. If they've stepped on it, then it's most likely the lower limbs um, that are affected. And often it requires amputation afterwards because of the traumatic nature of the injury. And we see that the young, because children are smaller, mm -hmm. when they are injured by a landline, landmine, then it affects more of their body and also their face because they're so much closer to the ground. And it can be mistaken for being a toy because it's shiny, right? The outside of it? It depends on the landmine, but yeah. sometimes they're toys, sometimes they're just hidden. So sometimes somebody can walk over one without even knowing that there was something there in the first place. And who does it affect more, men or women? Uh, right now we're seeing that the majority of the casualties are men and boys. Um, but what we also have seen is that uh, in those cases where women are, and girls are affected, because often they're in situations that are farther from first aid uh, or have more problematic access to uh, emergency healthcare services, then they're more likely to be killed by the landmine than, an, than a man or a boy. And I'm thinking too, in some of these communities, the, uh, the boys and the men would be the ones who are working and providing for the families too. So it has a ripple effect. Definitely. And Paul, uh, do they serve any advantage to armies on the battlefield? I don't think so. There was a study that the Red Cross did. It was a very pivotal study in, in the movement to ban landmines, which showed that, um, and this was all done by military mm -hmm. people who did the study and said they were never found to be a decisive factor in any military campaign. Um, they were obviously used in different purposes, but they were never played a decisive role in a victory. So why use them? Are they cheap or are they? They were cheap. They were, at the time before they were banned, they were probably one of the most uh, widely used weapons in the world and certainly the most uh, widely used uh, explosive weapon. And Jane, before the Ottawa Treaty came into effect, were there any rules that governed the, the use of landmines? Uh, no, there weren't real rules. I mean, they were covered by, or the, by the regular laws of war. But um, certainly, you know, when I started working in this field, you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, they were being used indiscriminately. So, you know, you could drive down a road and not be sure if somebody had laid something there that morning. Um, you could 
you could come back along the same road in the evening and it, it would be appalling. And I think the thing we haven't referred to is there's the very practical impact that we've been talking about, but there's also that, that real legacy of fear that these, these landmines leave that, you know, as Paul says, there are still landmines in the ground laid decades ago and there are mothers and there are children who don't know if when they walk to school or they go to a well, whether or not they're going to step on them. And so it's that all pervasive fear that is in your life day in, day out. And that's almost impossible for us to imagine, I think. And I, I'm, I'm assuming there wasn't any laws where you had to take the mines out after a war ended. No, no. No. And before and that's the thing, they stay forever. You know, they, right. they, this is the weapon that carries on being a weapon after the war is finished. And so before the Ottawa Treaty, was there any assistance uh, offered to, uh, to victims of landmines? Well, the, the assistance that landmines need is, first of all, good medical care to stabilize them after the injuries, and then furthermore access to rehabilitation, um, similar to people with other kinds of traumatic injuries. So the, it really depends on where that occurs and what access to services those people would have previous, like what services are available within that context. So if it's happening in a wealthy country with public health services, then those victims would have a much better chance of not only survival, but being able to regain function and reintegrate themselves into their community and carry out the necessary activities of daily life. But if it happens in a poor income country in a rural area where even having transportation to the one major center that might have a hospital that's equipped to uh, amputate somebody properly or to provide a prosthetic device, then those same inequalities and marginalizations will be there for those um, landmine victims. And so often we're seeing that the countries um, most affected by landmines are those for uh, low-income countries that do not have good access to medical services. So that's an, a crucial part of, of the treaty, is trying to make sure that in those places where landmines, uh, where, where communities are at risk of, of landmine injuries, that we make sure that services are available in case of accidents. And so before the treaty, Paul, um, I wanted to get, get a sense, was there any desire to ban landmines? Well, certainly, um, Jane and I both come from the development community. We were both ex-Oxfam staffers, mm -hmm. and, and we certainly saw it in our, in our field work. And there was always efforts to try and get armies to do things properly, pick up the mines they laid, mark the areas, let communities know. Nobody ever did that. So there were efforts that went from trying to convince armies to do best practices, to self-regulate, to try and regulate, but none of those really ever stood and they didn't really stick. And it was only until the ICBL was formed, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, which called for a global ban, that things changed. And that's when people started thinking, oh, maybe there is a solution to this. Um, Why do you think that changed things? I think because the mechanisms that, that Jane was talking about, the, the rules of, of war, um, they're very difficult to, to change. It's all consensus based in the UN, so one country can block. Consensus really means one country can veto anything. Um, and therefore, you negotiate down to the most common denominator that you can get an agreement on. And that means you end up with weak, um, weak agreements. So there's one called the Protocol 2 of the Convention on Conventional Weapons. It's really weak, and it really has had no impact whatsoever. And when, when campaigners and, and governments that were interested in seeing change tried to strengthen that, it failed. And that's when they decided and Canada led the effort to go outside the UN and actually call for a ban. And I think the ban crystallized everyone's thinking that there actually is a solution to this, and the solution is we never use this weapon again. And then we help the people who have been victimized and we get the mines out of the ground. And I should mention that, um, I don't know if this has ever happened on the show before, uh, I could be wrong, but uh, the three organizations that you represent um, were recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997. Um, can we talk about that a little bit, please? <laughs> and Jane? Well, of course, it was, um, it was a moment of immense pride to, 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 to mag to my organization and to the organizations represented around the table here who were all part of the international campaign to ban landmines. But 
setting aside our own organisational pride, what was really important was that this really was uh, an award for all those people who had said, it is possible to change the world. It is possible to say, this is something which is ethically and morally wrong, and we can put that ethics and that moral stance together into something which is intensely practical. And I think it also recognised the, the game-changing impact that having a group of organisations like ours come together with like-minded governments under the leadership of the Canadian government, which was amazing, we, we really can do something which is so much greater than, than we'd be able to do on our own. And that's what the Nobel Peace Prize marked as much as anything. And what was Canada's role in this? Well, Canada played a really strong role, both Canadians and their government. Um, we wouldn't be where we are now, and we wouldn't be having a 20th anniversary if Lloyd Axworthy, who was then Canada's foreign affairs minister, challenged the world to negotiate a treaty and come back to Ottawa and sign it. And he challenged them to do it in a year which is unheard of. Treaties in those days could take five, 10 years to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So he really challenged them and he set a deadline and he shocked everyone when he, did, when he made that challenge. And I, I was at the, at the conference when he did that and it was like the NGOs were up on their feet applauding and all the diplomats, you could see their jaws were almost on the table. Mm -hmm. They were just so shocked because when you have diplomatic conferences, you know what's going to happen before you go in. You, they almost always have agreement ahead of time and he surprised everyone. And then they followed it up. It wasn't just that he made the call. Canada put a whole lot of diplomatic effort into this. They supported the Red Cross and the UN to have conferences. They brought in NGOs from around the world. We traveled all over the world, convincing governments one at a time to come to Ottawa in, in December three and four in 1997, 122 of them showed up in Ottawa to, to sign the treaty. Was this, was this an, an unusual thing for NGOs to get an international treaty passed? Yeah, it was like the first time that we were ever able to um, be in, in the room, part of the negotiation, almost like equals. We were always at the back and we're still always at the back, mm -hmm. but we are now, it's pretty common for us to be in the room. It happened on the Convention on Cluster Munitions, it happened on the Arms Trade Treaty, it happened on the recent uh, Nuclear Weapons Pro Prohibition Treaty, which uh, our colleagues ICANN are getting the Nobel Peace Prize this year for. Uh, it's quite, normal now for NGOs to drive the process and partner with governments and international organizations to make it work. Perhaps I could just add to that, which I completely agree with what Paul said, but I think what bringing the NGO voice to the table did was, was also bring to the table the people who are on the ground day in, day out. You know, mm -hmm. the, the organization I represent here, uh, we have people on the ground clearing landmines, working with communities every day and bringing that knowledge and that credibility to that high-level diplomatic uh, debate was, was very new at that time. And through that, we were also able to bring the voice of those people who were living day in, day out with this weapon. So I think that was also a, a different flavour of international discussion, which we still have, as, as Paul says, in things like the, 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 the recent nuclear treaty this year. And I mean, to look back 20 years with the Ottawa Treaty, it must be something for your organization too, Miroslava. What did they play in getting the treaty onto the table? Well, again, I think it was a, a team effort. Each NGO has its role to play and each has a, a complementarity. But one of the, the components of the treaty that um, we see as crucial up until today is also the, the voices and the involvement of landmine survivors. So not just the NGOs and not just the deminers, but the voices of survivors and other persons with disabilities and their caregivers and their families and the affected communities themselves, not just to speak out against it, but also to, try to work with their governments and within their communities on, on policies and on reconstruction plans and, and that the crucial place of the voice of survivors in affected communities was embedded into the treaty and is and that allows for that voice and that involvement to continue up till up until this day so i'm interested to know so what was in the treaty paul well the treaty is both a, it's an interesting mix it's a disarmament treaty and a humanitarian treaty and the disarmament side of it is you ban the use of the weapon 
production, trade, transfer, and you eliminate the stockpiles. Mm -hmm. And the humanitarian side is you clear the land, demining, you help survivors. Uh, you In what ways do you help survivors? Um, countries in position to do so are obligated to provide assistance to countries that need assistance and what we're working on is getting them to understand that they have obligations, put plans in place, um, study what the best practices are and mm -hmm. see how they can get to the best practices. We, and, and it's really evolved into a rights-based approach to, to victim assistance. So these people have a right mm -hmm. to a livelihood and they have rights that need to be upheld. And, and yes, the victim assistance starts with the initial first aid to the victims, but then includes rehabilitation. So once somebody is stabilized, once they're out of the hospital, then they need to have access to physiotherapy, to occupational therapy, to assistive devices. So if somebody's been amputated, that means prosthetics, so that they can learn to walk again, so that they can, uh, again, carry out a livelihood. So we, uh, we label that as social, social inclusion, to participate in the community's economic inclusion, whether that means going back into formal labor or uh, informal labor, starting up their own business. Um, um, and then also empowering those people to be advocates for, for their own needs and their own rights, for children to make sure that they can get back into school. And they may not be able to go back to school because their families are saying, oh, they're injured, they have a disability now, there's no point in sending them to school. Or maybe the family wants to, but without a wheelchair or without a, a prosthetic, it's and they physically can't mm -hmm. get there, particularly um, in, in rural communities. There may not be a bus system, so they need to be able to get from point A to point B. And another thing that was crucial to the, the treaty is, as I mentioned before, many of the places where landmines um, are wreaking havoc are places where there are not these systems already in place. Uh, schools are not accessible, workplaces are not accessible, transportation is not accessible, um, and those initial rehabilitation services may not even be there. They may not be recognized. They may not be tra training uh, prosthetics or orthotics technicians. And in the treaty, there is embedded in it the principle of non-discrimination. So when the services are put in place for the landmine survivors, then they need to be accessible to the broader community so that if somebody is injured, regardless of the cause of the injury, then they will have access to those same rehabilitation services. And that's crucial for transforming um, the image of, of injured persons within their community. Now, there's a, there's a lot of countries who haven't signed on to it, um, 30 countries, including some of the biggest, Russia, U.S. and China, why is that? I think they all have different reasons, and there is no question we would strongly encourage all countries to sign up. I mean, in the case of the U.S., they haven't signed, but they've been the largest donor to demining activities over time. However, I think what's really important to say is, yes, you're right, there, there are countries who have not signed up, but 162 have. And that is the most extraordinary success. And it makes the Ottawa Treaty one of the most, if not the most, uh, successful pieces of international legislation that we've ever seen. Well, I said 30 countries, but it's just over 30 countries. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, some of these countries who haven't signed on to the, uh, the treaty, I wonder if there's a fear that if they, if they do get rid of landmines, that means that other weapons that they use, other controversial uh, weapons that they use, like drones, might become threatened. Do you think that's one of the reasons? I, I don't think so. I think um, those that have the ability to have drones and other weapons like that, modern weapons, they have the capacity to do that anyways, and they're not using landmines. Like, the U.S. hasn't used landmines almost since the treaty came into effect. Um, Many and the U.S., we should say, has actually played a key role in disarming, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, they've been, and they're certainly, as Jane said, they're the, the leading donor in, in mine action, all the elements of mine action, but particularly in, in uh, victim assistance and in, in clearance, demining. Um, so if they actually went, took the legal step to join, they would probably be the best state party, but they won't make that political decision. And there's reasons for that. Each country, as Jane said, have their own reason. But a lot of countries like... Uh, Laos and Vietnam who haven't joined yet can do so, but they feel, some of them feel like they may not be able to meet their obligation to clear land within the 10-year timeline because they are so heavily affected. Because the goal is 2025. Well, that's a, a, a pragmatic goal we've all set and the states have set, but that's for countries that are already in the treaty now. Mm -hmm. So if they join, uh, they would 
be able Need to more get time. more. They would have more time. And everybody recognizes that. But they have not yet figured that out politically themselves. But we would certainly welcome countries like that into the treaty. And we welcome all 35 and that are still outside. And we are going to go after all 35 until they join. So, Are there any countries that have gotten a completely landmine free? Oh, absolutely. In the, in the course of the last 20 years, uh, nearly 30 countries and territories have been declared free of the impact of landmines. And there are some real, you know, key successes in that. You know, I think particularly of Mozambique, you know, mm -hmm. when I worked there in the 1990s, you know, landmines were a fact of life for thousands of people. And now, you know, Mozambique is, is, is free of the impact of, of landmines. It's an extraordinary achievement, absolutely amazing. When, when the treaty came into effect, people in Mozambique and others said it would take 100 years yeah. to clear the mines. It was such a heavily affected country, and they're now landmine free. So do you think the, the treaty has been effective? The treaty's had a great effect. Mm -hmm. it, it concentrated donors' minds. It concentrated the national government. They, they, take more ownership on the on the issue now. They don't just leave it to donors, but they work with donors. And the, org the countries where they've allowed organizations like Jane's and, and Handicap International in and other humanitarian mine action organizations, they clear their minds much faster than if they try to do it themselves mm -hmm. through their own military. Well, we have a board here with a list of the top 10 donors to uh, mine action for the year 2015. As you can see, the United States is well above everyone else with almost $120 million in 2015. The U.S. contributes the most, even though it's not a signatory. Why is that, Paul? Well, there's a number of reasons, one of which uh, Senator Patrick Leahy has been a, a great champion, uh, Senator from Vermont, which I always describe as Canada's 11th province. <laughs> uh, um, he's been a great champion. He's really championing the cause of, of landmine survivors within the U.S. But I think they also understand that um, through USAID and other mechanisms that landmines are a lethal barrier to development. If we want these countries to, to and their citizens to be able to reach their full potential, we need to remove those lethal barriers. And those who have been victimized need to have their, the ability to regain their livelihoods. And I think the U.S. as a government has understood that for over 20 years now. and through every administration, and that's what we need. It's that kind of consistency and that leadership. We've uh, got we've 10. got 30 seconds, but okay. I want to sneak in one more question for you, Paul. Uh, to what extent has the treaty adapted to the rise of non-state actors like ISIS? Well, uh, we the treaty has con countries belong to the treaty condemn all use. We engage with uh, non-state actors who are have legitimate political goals and inform them that they should not be using these weapons either and their their own people are killed and injured and then we have clearance organizations who go in like jane in these emergency situations and clear the the contamination and we have organizations like hi who go in and help the people who have been victimized by them well paul jane and miroslava thank you so much for being here and as we acknowledge the 20th anniversary of the ottawa treaty and thank you for all the work that you do Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.